not originally his. <laughs> so when I began my study of iconography many years ago, I was showing an icon that I had finished to a friend of mine, an artist friend, who, after I explained that iconographers always look to the ancient prototypes for guidance and inspiration, she suggested, quote, well, maybe someday we'll use the technique to make something more personal. <laughs> this did not seem to me to be the moment to point out to her the many influences that informed her own creative artwork. And I have not yet worked out what I hope is a coherent kerygma. I'm going to be using a lot of Greek words here. That's a word that means proclamation. I had not worked out my kerygma about the ways in which iconography is every bit as creative an endeavor as the so-called fine arts. In my last talk, I likened iconography to the ancient monastic scriptoria, where monks fastidiously copied scripture while embellishing the text with illuminations and decorative initials. Or, I suggested, that maybe iconography is more like the performing arts, where artists like Glenn Gould play Bach. He plays the notes as they are written, and nobody calls him a copyist. <laughs> or the dancers who dance the roles that others have choreographed and have danced before them. And thinking about this talk, however, I find that even this metaphor falls a little short, as iconographers actually have far more leeway in our interpretation of the ancient prototypes than do the actors that read the lines that the playwrights have written. Icons are often described as the gospel in light and color. The gospels, of course, are made up of words on page. But before that, they were transmitted verbally for generations before being first set down in ancient Greek and then translated into as many languages as humans have come up with. And within those languages, with as many interpretations or translations, I'm sure you all have your favorite translation of the Bible. Each of these translations tells the same story, but each has a different emphasis or a different voice. For that matter, each of the four canonical gospels were written down in that same language of Greek, but, and they tell the same story, but, they were speaking to different audiences, making, or making different theological nuances stand out, and to very different dramatic effect. Here, finally, question mark, I think I have found the best metaphor for what it is that I think that iconographers do. We are translating scripture from the written word to the written icon. Now, depending on who you ask, this is the reason why icons are often said to be written rather than painted. <coughs> In my opinion, it's a little bit of a conceit um, and seems to have something to do with the fact that the Russian word for writing and painting is the same word. But it is a way of signaling that we're not just fine artists painting whatever we want to paint. So this notion of writing, once again, evokes those monastic scribes copying scripture word for word, albeit in their own hand. We can say that theirs is an art of transcription. As for those performing artists that play the notes as written or dance the dance already choreographed or read the soliloquy verbatim, theirs is the art of interpretation. So what I'm suggesting is that what iconographers do is closer to literary 
or biblical translation than to either transcription or interpretation. So let's take an example. Here's an icon that's known as the Hospitality of Abraham. It translates the story in Genesis 18 of the visit of three strangers to Abraham and Sarah, who foretell the birth of Isaac, who in turn will father Jacob, and thus the nation of Israel. In the same way that we all needed to learn how to read before we ourselves could read Genesis 18, viewers of icons need to learn to read the symbolic conventions and tropes that make up this iconographic alphabet and grammar. Here we see, but I'm going to help you learn to read. So we see here these three strangers are depicted with wings. Not to imply that they are actual angels. The text, in fact, just calls them men. But to describe their roles as messengers, which is the meaning of the word angel, comes from the Greek word angelos and means messenger. This, by the way, is why uh, icons of angels the angel will be holding a messenger's staff. It's not a sword or a spear or a lance, it's a staff. Now while it may look like they're eating al fresco, this red drapery above Sarah's head tells us that in fact this is happening inside the tent. The gold background lets us know that the event being depicted is one that involves an inbreaking of the divine. Otherwise, this icon more or less illustrates the account in Genesis 18. Let's compare this to the icon par excellence by Andre Rublev, in which the artist has stripped away all reference to Abraham and Sarah to concentrate our attention on these three messengers. Now, those of you who remember your Sunday school lessons, and Nancy had you in the front row, will remember <laughs> <laughs> that Abraham and Sarah were originally called Abram and Sarai, but they were renamed by God after the initial promise to make Abraham a father of many nations. This renaming of people happens over and over in both the Hebrew and New Testaments. At those key moments when someone's life is upended, whether they like it or not, by God. By stripping away all of the narrative elements of Genesis 18, Rublev has translated the event and given the story a new name. In fact, this is known as the Old Testament Trinity. This new name indicates a prefiguration of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. Volumes, and I mean volumes, have been written about this icon, so I'm not going to spend much time here, except to point out that Robles' use of a circular composition and the movement and direction of the gazes beautifully expresses the mystery of three persons in one Godhead, <clears throat> as well as a pre-celebration, if you will, of the Eucharist, where the angel commonly identified as Christ sits within the chalice formed by the space between the three angels. None of this, by the way, is my own observation. This is from reading those books about this icon. <laughs> So when we think of creativity as doing something new, sometimes it has more to do with not doing something that has always been done. And while the beauty of line and luminosity of color that Rublev employs here are breathtaking, the real genius of Rublev's revolutionary translation of the hospitality of Abraham lies less with what or how he paints than by what he chooses not to paint. I love that quote. Okay. 
it occurred to me as a, when it was too late to change anything that I'm crazy to show you that icon right before I showed you a couple of icons <laughs> by my hand. <laughs> but in the same way that there are writers and readers of scripture, there are iconographers and viewers of icons. If an icon amounts to a particular translation of a passage from scripture or the life of a saint or other events from church tradition, then it too can be read and interpreted, a process known as exegesis, another one of those Greek words that means to track down or to guide, as in to find the meaning of. So now I'm going to look at a couple of icons by my hand. <laughs> yeah, be laughing at the New Jersey. Um, <laughs> um, oops, there goes my the icon on the left of St. George and the Dragon is nearly as famous, among iconographers anyway, as Rublev's Trinity. It's in the collection of the State Russian Museum in St. Petersburg, and I've had the great privilege of seeing it three times, once there and twice in the U.S. when it was in a two different exhibitions. And I've wanted to try my hand at translating it for many years. So I'm gonna give you a minute to just kind of look at the two and kind of make a mental note of some of the differences that you see. Anybody who's familiar with the icon from Novgorod would look at my icon and say, oh, this is a Novgorod. So this type of icon of St. George and the Dragon is called the concise version, as opposed to the detailed version. And I'll draw your attention to, uh, I was thrilled when I walked in here that there are icons on the wall. There is a contemporary icon over there in the sort of bluish green frame that is of a type called a Vita icon that shows scenes of the life of the saint around some sort of central image. And that is an extremely detailed version. Detailed types translate more details of the legend. Now what we know for certain about St. George is not a lot. Most accounts agree that he was born in the late third century in Cappadocia and raised in a Christian household. He became a centurion or a commander in the Roman army and was killed by decapitation in 303 during the persecutions of the early Christians under the emperor Diocletian for refusing to renounce his faith. But for most of us, St. George summons images of him battling that dragon and the legend goes something like this. There was a town, perhaps in current day Libya, on the edge of a lake, in which a creature variously described as a dragon or a serpent lived and prevented the townsfolk from drawing water from the lake and generally terrorized them as dragons are wont to do. To placate the dragon, the townspeople fed it two sheep a week until they ran out of sheep. So, so they were not great animal pets, you know, husbands. <laughs> they then began to sacrifice the children of the town who were chosen by lot. One day, as luck would have it, the lot fell on the king's daughter. He offered all his riches to anyone who would take her place, but not surprisingly, no one volunteered. <laughs> that lot of good, right? All the riches the world will do if you're in the belly of a dragon. As she approached the lake weeping, George rode by, and after hearing her sad tale, gave the sign of the cross, invoked the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and struck, but did not kill, the dragon with his lance. 
He then instructed the princes, the princess on the counts named her Elizabeth, to throw her belt around its neck, and the strange trio walked back to the town, the dragon now tamed and following the princess like a well-trained dog. This is a different icon. This is from Belcarad, essentially the same translation of the story. Here Christ is shown in a man, Dorla. Actually, that isn't Christ, is it? Is it? No. It's St. Nicholas. Yeah. Huh? Okay. St. Nicholas, <laughs> uh, which is interesting um, because this is what happens when you're working on a screen this big. I just assumed it was Christ. Um, so most likely the patron who commissioned this icon, maybe his name's sake was Nicholas, maybe it was a he lived in a town or it was a church that was dedicated to St. Nicholas. Um, but in any event, here Nicholas is standing in for Christ blessing George's actions. In both versions, an angel is crowning George as a victory bearer, as he is known. Because George is victorious not only over the dragon, but the townsfolk are all baptized as Christians. And if this were a Disney movie, no doubt George and Elizabeth would be married and live happily ever after. So now we're going to do some exegesis. We're going to read these icons with a view toward uncovering what they say about this particular saint. So we're going to explore it through sort of a narrative historical lens. In almost all icons of St. George, he's astride a horse wearing military armor with a red cape which billows out behind him. As a centurion, George would indeed have ridden a horse and would indeed have worn armor and a cape. While his horse may have been white and his cape may have been red, in these icons, these indicate his purity of heart, the white horse, and the manner of his death. Martyrs are generally dressed in red garments. The color of the blood may have spilled for their faith. That he was victorious not through his own might and military prowess, but by calling on God for strength is indicated by the presence of well, it's usually Christ, but in this case, Nicholas, <laughs> or the angels. If we compare these two icons side by side, we see a number of differences, many of which are simply aesthetic and stylistic. But I'd like to draw your attention to one in particular detail, the cave that is in the lower left corner of the icon on your right. And so now we're going to read these icons allegorically. I'm sure you are all familiar with Plato's allegory of the cave, wherein those who have not been educated in his theory of forms are likened to prisoners chained to the wall of the cave. A cave. Behind them is a fire that show, throws the shadows of objects and people that pass in front of the fire on the wall that the prisoners face. Not knowing any better, the prisoners assume that the shadows that they see are reality to such a degree that if they were freed from their chains, Plato supposed, they would rather remain in the cave watching shadows than leave the familiarity of the cave and stare at reality, you know, full face. So now if we look at these icons through the lens of analogy, the dragon emerges from the realm of the shadows and becomes a symbol of the ignorance and superstition of the pagan townsfolk. We might ask, 
Did the dragon really demand the sacrifice of sheep, much less children? Or did their superstitions simply make them think that it did? In this reading, St. George and his horse become a symbol for the church with Christ as it, at its head, whose sacrifice on the cross was once for all, Hebrews 10, and put an end to the practice of animal sacrifice. Or, and or, this icon can be seen as an allegorical image of the eschaton, the end of the world and the second coming, with the dragon here playing the role of Satan, the cave, hell, and the walled town of prefiguration of the heavenly Jerusalem. In Revelation 6, 1, the first of the four horsemen is summoned by one of those four living creatures. I looked and there was a white horse. Its rider had a bow and the crown was given to him and he came out conquering and to conquer. Later in the book, we hear that the great dragon was thrown down. That ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. So as you can see, when you read an icon allegorically, as with scripture, there's no one perfect answer. So now we're going to turn back to the stripped down, concise version, a uh, translation of the icon, and we're going to read it anagogically. Who knows what that word means? Well, <laughs> it's from a Greek word, anagoge, or anagogy, that means to climb or to ascend. Those funny little mountains that are in icons, pretty much any icon that has a landscape, <coughs> is a symbol of this anagoge, this ascent toward God, where the ascetic lives a spiritually disciplined life and therefore sort of climbs this ladder of divine ascent. So what I want to suggest is maybe this icon is not an icon about St. George at all. Maybe the landscape is not a lakeside town in Libya. Maybe it is a landscape of the human heart. In fact, Oh, since this is being recorded, maybe I'll read the quote. The heart is from Macarius the Great. The heart itself is only a small vessel, yet dragons are there, and lions. There are poisonous beasts and the treasures of evil. There are rough and uneven roads. There are precipices, but there too are God and the angels. Life is there, and the kingdom. There too is light, and there are the apostles and heavenly cities and treasures of grace, all lie, all things lie within that little space. In Luke 17, Christ himself proclaims, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. If then, this is an icon, a word which means simply image, of the human heart, then who are all these people? Clearly, George is who we are meant to aspire to become like. He has, in the words of St. Paul, put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for helmet, okay, he's not wearing a helmet, the hope of salvation. He is a spiritual warrior. What does that make the dragon? It's easy to assume that the dragon represents Satan as he as he did when we looked at the icon allegorically. But some early church fathers, particularly Evagrius of Pontus and Maximus the Confessor, would likely identify the dragon as a symbol for what they called the logism. Related to the Greek word logos, which 
means word. The logismi are those, are thoughts, the insidious, unbidden thoughts that distract us or tempt us or convince us to act in ways that are contrary to our better nature. In this reading of the icon, St. George is victorious, not over Satan, but of a much more dastardly foe, himself, his own unruly thoughts. But that's not all George has tamed. What did George have to tame before he could tame that dragon? In the icon. The horse. <laughs> right. First he had to tame the horse, which we can read in this way as a symbol for his passions. He has reached a state, a desirable state called, in ancient Greek, apathia, a word from which we get the word apathy, which now has a negative connotation, but apathia is a state of detachment from emotion. And he's done this through prayer and, and ascetic disciplines. Again, these are symbolized by those funny little mountains called, in Russian, Gorky, which means little mountain. As well as a complete reliance, not on himself, but on God. This is a really long, roundabout way of <laughs> drawing to your attention a couple of itty bitty changes that I made in my translation of this icon. And I'm not talking about different color schemes or other kind of aesthetic changes. In this arena, the iconographer does have a fair amount of freedom, but rather of two significant lines that I changed. Any horseback riders out there? Would you ride a horse the way my George is riding a horse? Compare the reins on the Novgorod icon to the one by my hand. My George has almost literally let go of the reins, suggesting, I hope, to the viewer, to let go of the reins of self-reliance. Other change I made is to the, the point of George's spear, which in my version simply pierces the flame-like tongue of the dragon. Here I am reminding the viewer, okay, myself, <laughs> that if any think that they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. James 1, 26. These are really the only two significant changes that I made when I translated this icon. The many other changes are, for the most part, simply aesthetic or personal preference. And I'll mention just a few. But first, let me ask, when I asked you before to make a mental note of the difference, did anybody catch those two things? No. Didn't think so. But it's hard and a great big you know, finish. So here's a few of the changes that I made. So the uh, Novgorod iconographer uh, painted his halo with white paint. I'm guessing, I don't know this, maybe somebody out there does, I'm guessing that he didn't have gold leaf, um, which is generally what is used to symbolize the, the uncreated light of God. Um, but I had gold leaf, and so I gilded the halo. The use of a, a red background is typical and quite popular among Novgorod iconographers. I wonder if they had access to a lot of cinnabar, which is the pigment that they would have used. Now, had the artist made George's cape, 
red, it would have disappeared into the background. So he chose to make the cape green, which is quite a bold bit of creative license, which allows the background now to be a stand-in as a symbol of George's martyrdom. I kept the color scheme more or less intact. I made my um, cape more billowy and more puss upon. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Oh, Fred, Fred, go back. <laughs> <laughs> Eyes. 
In this, Christ's eyes are closed in death and with an expression of one who has died a torturous death. His mother, on the other hand, seems strangely placid and almost smiling. Again, the cross is behind them. And this one, again, places the scene outside the walled city of Jerusalem on Golgotha with the instrument of Christ's death behind them. Unlike the other two versions, this tomb actually looks large enough to hold a full-grown man. <laughs> Here again, Christ is dead, and he is upright only because of the embrace of his mother. What draws me to the museum's version is the simplicity of its composition. And I've realized in the process of putting this talk together that my aesthetics are very much comparable to my personal theological bent, so which is apophatic. It's a Greek word. <laughs> It means without words, and it refers to a type of theology that essentially says God is completely unknowable to us. So we, it's also sometimes called negative theology, which of course has a negative connotation. Um, but it's to say we can only describe God by what God is not. God is incomprehensible. He's uncircumscribable. Is indescribable, and so on, as opposed to cataphatic theology, which attempts to describe God by God's qualities. God is love, God is mercy, God is light. So, so I think it's that simplicity and the lack of words that this iconographer used that first pulled me to it. So, I noticed that like, what? I'll go backwards. So, in this icon, right, Mary is really holding her dead son upright. But there's a type of icon which is kind of the bookend image of Mother Do Not Weep, in which the young Christ is holding on to his mother, sort of for dear life, as babies who are completely dependent on their mother will do. So when I first began to sketch this icon, and this is how I work, other, other iconographers draw directly on the board, I, that's not me. Uh, so first I do what's nearly a tracing of the icon, and then I live with that for a while. But you'll see I made a change. Can you see the change I made? So there's the original, there's my first sketch. No, turn it down. I turned her hand. <laughs> By doing that, I turned this into a type of icon of the Mother of God known as the Hodegitria, she who shows the way. And in this type of icon, Mary holds a slightly older, more independent Christ. There's distance between them. He is not as dependent on her as he was. He holds a scroll of knowledge and wisdom, and he is even blessing. So this is a prefiguration of the Christ Pantocrator, who will rule over all. Another version. And then back to what is probably 
familiar to most of you, the icon that's known as the Virgin of Vladimir, or Vladimirskaya, which means from Vladimir, um, which is both the Hodigitria and a tenderness icon. Um, they are cheek to cheek. Uh, and again, as I thought about why do you want to why do you want to paint this icon, Mother Do Not Weep? I love the fact that they share this one line in both their faces. And Christ's eye becomes Mary's other eye in a way. And I love that in this icon. But as I did the sketch, I just wasn't feeling it, folks. Um, the fact is that most icons, and you probably noticed this, most icons almost always show both eyes of the figure being depicted. This is because you cannot have a relationship with somebody who is not looking. So you, you, will, you will see icons such as this icon of the nativity where you have a couple of people in profile. The handmaid over here who's giving the newborn baby a bath. And here is the tempter talking to St. Joseph saying, you know, if I were you, I'd I would marry her, you know, just send her away in the middle of the night. So, and you will often see demons depicted in full profile. In the Last Supper, many icons, I hope that would be the case with this one here, but it's not. There's usually only one figure who's in profile. Who do you imagine that is? <laughs> yes. So, I thought, okay, I'm sorry. I want the mother of God looking at me. So, so you see, I changed um, the sketch. But I wasn't crazy about this either. It made for this rather awkward triangle between the two faces. And I tried to persuade myself, oh, that could be a symbol for the Trinity. Um, but, it just did. I, I, in fact, put this image on a board, big board, um, and got it almost done. And then I brought it back to the company from whom I purchased it and had it just sanded off and re um, Because in the meantime, I had been commissioned to create an icon of this type for a friend. Um, and I reworked the drawing. And this is what I finally came up with, which, uh, you know, I am not worthy, but seemed to me to kind of do both things, right? You know, Mary looks at us, so you catch her gaze. Um, her hand gestures to her dead son, as if to say, <laughs> Look what you've done. Um, our eye then goes up to Christ's face, which bends toward his mother. And like a Hadagitria, we become part of this kind of sacred conversation. This was my idea. And there is the final icon. So, Let's see, I think I have a slide here of the two side by side. So other changes I made, um, obviously I've got this, and I have to say this, all the photographs here distort the colors a little bit. It's not that purple. It reads more really, really dark. Um, and it is not meant to be the darkness of the tomb 
it's meant to be a symbol of like the unknowability of God, the central mystery of Christianity. Um, this darkness, however, is not so pretty. That is the darkness of the tomb, the darkness of sin, the fallen world. Um, I added just two, four letters, Nika, N-I-K-A, which means Nike. It means victory, victory. right. Um, again, just a, a reminder that um, all is not lost. So if I was going to read this icon anagogically, which I had to do now to prepare for this lecture, <laughs> I think this too is an image of the human heart. Um, with Mary being an image of the soul, which is a usually understood to be a feminine word in Hebrew, the spirit is ruach, um, uh, alma in Latin, and Latin-based, um, and within our soul is planted, it's believed by Christians, a seed of Christ, the Logos Emmanuel, the God with us, the God within us. And so as I found myself pondering this talk, I'm thinking, well, what then is this saying? Um, and I'm thinking that what it is saying is that we must first die to self, we must crucify our egos, so that we can be reborn a new creation, as St. Paul says, you know, it is no longer I who live, but Christ, you know, because I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ within me. And this notion of the Logos Emmanuel is very important to the teaching and the theology of the Prosopon School. You go upstairs, you'll see this wild image at the back wall of a young man with wings, uh, which is uh, the Logos Emmanuel, surrounded by the synaxis of the archangels. Um, oh, you know, just for fun, because I like painting decorations and because it's a pretty austere image, I did put some sort of floral decoration on the sarcophagus and a very careful observer will notice there are bunches of grapes. It's a, you know, implying the Eucharist. Um, if you look at icons of the nativity, um, you will see that the Christ child, the swaddled child, is usually on what looks an awful lot like a sacrificial altar or a tomb, and that's not by accident, that is a way of, of putting all, all of the moments of the story in one place, in eternity, where all things happen simultaneously. That's it. How about, how about? Right, and I 
I dropped my drawing up to show my teacher Vlada Slav, and I said, what do you think? And I'm expecting Vlada, Vlada Slav to say, oh my god, you're a genius. <laughs> and he says, oh yeah, that, yeah, yeah, there are many ancient prototypes like that. <laughs> and sure enough, I started looking, and I'm far from the first <coughs> person to think that that was um, a good way to translate that image. Now, there, you know, there's haters everywhere, and the Prusipan School has critics. Um, you know, a history will judge, God will judge. You know, um, you know I think for having been with the school now for close to 25 years, I would say that I, I've witnessed an evolution of the style in that the colors have become much more transparent and more intense, more vibration. Has anybody taken a workshop with Vladislav? He's always talking about vibration. Um, and this is only possible because we have access now to pigments that the ancient iconographers didn't. You know, it, it, there are some schools that will only icons to look very much like the ancient ones. And I don't want to speak for Vladislav, but for myself, um, that would be a kind of a artificial restriction uh, to put on us. And, you know, that we have pigments that we think can better express this inexpressible mystery of God um, I think we should use them. But to stay again within this canon of centuries of tradition to be respectful, you know, if somebody writes a poem, right, with five lines, you can't call it a haiku, right? So there is a limit to what we can do with the image. Um, at a certain point, it stops being an icon, and it becomes, you know, a picture of a person with a halo. Um, and so that's a fine line. And again, I, I, I don't know. I don't know where that line is. You know, I think of the Supreme Court Justice who said he could have defined pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. You know, you can see many icons that are beautiful, but don't touch you. Um, and you can see, you know, walk through this museum, you'll see many icons that are painted by a very unsophisticated hand, but which break your heart. Um, so it's that je ne sais pas <laughs> that we shoot for. But certainly there are those who are much more conservative than the Prusipan school so, in their interpretation. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm thinking that these um, icons were done with uh, big tempera. Correct. Yes. Okay. yes. And was the traditional method of going from dark to light? Green? Absolutely. Yes. We do the same thing. So we start with a gessoed wood board. That white um, functions as a symbol for the uncreated light of God, the light of the first day. Let there be light. That's not this light. Right, this light got made on the fourth day. Um, but also from a, um, a scientific standpoint, we're gonna paint with these pigments that are suspended in uh, a solution of egg, egg yolk. Um, so it'll be very transparent and the light will penetrate those layers and bounce back out, which is what gives icons, a kind of some icons, a kind of a luminosity that you're not going to get in other media. You'll never get it in acrylic. I forgive me, anybody here who paints icons in acrylic, but you know, I'm sorry. Light is not gonna. It's not gonna do what it does with egg tempera. And the gold is it, the gold. The um, gold. The gold is gold leaf. Uh, gold Twenty-three, leaf, yeah. twenty-four karat gold leaf. Um, you might think it's the most expensive 
material we use is by far not. I probably used a dollar's worth of gold on St. George's <laughs> halo. This is only about that big. Um, and maybe on that icon, um, which is almost the same size as that. You know, the two halos is maybe five dollars worth of, of gold leaf. What we spend our money on are um, certain rare natural pigments. Azurite is the most expensive pigment I have, but there is nothing like it. Um, and the board itself. Um, I have gessoed my own wood board. You know, I, I don't have that many years left. I can paint <laughs> or, I can or I can prepare boards. So I buy, I, you know, I buy my boards already prepared. Um, but otherwise we do, you know, with the exception of using pigments that um, either now are man-made, you know, in a chemistry lab um, or um, using a photocopier to a large extent, we, you know, adhere to the same methods that icons have been made for centuries, in part because this uh, beautiful symbolism has accrued and the process itself, the making of the icon becomes an icon. You know, it's, I mean, it, in, that, in that way, it is a performance, right? It's time-based. I make an icon and my doing is an image that isn't fixed in tangible media. What is the thinking in the development process between the use of simple orange wood and the gesso wood? Using simple, what barn board. Barn board. Well, it, again, most of the technical aspects of the icon have developed because they work, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, someone would say, oh, I'm looking for the perfect symbol of, you know, the uncreated light of God. So, you know, what happened was people had wood boards and figured out that if they painted on the boards directly, the board would crack and there'd be a split through the middle of the icon. So they figured out, hmm, okay, well, let's fit a couple of these cross braces in behind, but not glue them in, we'll just, you know, pressure fit them in to allow the board to extend and contract. Let's do that. Um, you know what, it's even better if we cover the wood with a piece of linen and then gesso it. And now we have this very hard but absorbent, um, beautifully white because it's made with gypsum and chalk and marble dust surface, you know, and then it's not a, much of a stretch to say, my goodness, I'm about to create an icon. I'm recapitulating in a very humble way the creation of the cosmos by God. So you don't, you're not confronted with some sort of contrarian school which would say, oh, you're, you're engaging in a modernist tendency. By doing what? By, by doing the gesso. No, no, all the ancient icons are gessoed. Okay. Yeah, these icons are all gessoed with words. Okay. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have lasted this long. Yeah. I mean, again, that's the beauty. The ancients were very smart. <laughs> what um, is the reason for silver covers? So those are variously called a riza or an aklat. Um, I think the original intent was to sort of enhance the mystery, right? So, you know, in an Orthodox church, you have the icon of Spastus and the altar is behind it. You know, so the laity don't actually see the Eucharist. Um, and so it, it may have been a way to do that. I think this became kind of, as people are wont to do, became about them instead of God and they wanted to show off that, oh look, I can afford a really fancy reason. Look, I can put pearls and rubies and 
gems on it. See how much more I love God than we do. So um, I'm not a big fan of, of those icons. I mean, I, you know, they're beautiful. Like a piece of jewelry is beautiful, but it's not. It's not getting me to where I want to go. Yes. Actually, what I'm you're doing is what part of anything that is prayer. Oh, you're doing it? it's all prayer. I mean, how do you say prayers before you begin in the morning? Yes. Or how does that? Well, you know, um, you know, honestly, who among us are um, worthy of being iconographers? Nobody, certainly not me. Um, yes, I try to pray every day. I go to church most Sundays, missed it today. Um, uh, but, but yes, it, 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 the iconographer should be a person of deep faith uh, with, it is considered an ascetic discipline. Ascesis, a great word, it means to train like an athlete, right? It's not about self-denial for self-denial's sake. It's about disciplining yourself in small ways, like going to the gym, right? Um, so that when you need to do some heavy spiritual lifting, you know, you've got the muscles. So yes, I mean, when I paint, um, uh, the only time I will skip prayers before I start to paint is when I've been to Eucharist. I figure, I've got to count this. Uh, <laughs> but if I, but, you know, so, but, but I always say at least a short prayer, but there is a prayer that's been around for centuries, plus the hands of thy unworthy servant, you know, in this present task for the venerable portrayal of thine image, um, for the glory and adornment of thy holy church. Direct my heart and soul and grant unto me noetic, angelic illumination, um, that uh, my sins may be forgiven and those of the people who venerate this holy God. So, you know, but, but at minimum, I make the sign of the cross. <laughs> um, and do try to be in, I mean, it's, when I first started painting, I had to like kind of get myself in the right mindset. But now after doing it so many years, walking into the studio and smelling you know, the, the scent of a lot of incense that's been burned there and being in the space puts me in that place. It, it's now kind of Pavlovian. Um, and there are days when I go to the studio and don't paint. I just go to the studio and read and look at books about icons. So. Yes, ma'am. How did you begin to research uh, painting an icon of a saint who is um, not, uh, is more? Oh my God, that's a great story. I mean, that's a great question. And that's maybe the next, if I'm invited okay. back, I'll give, a, I'll give a talk about an icon that I am very close to finishing, which is a very dangerous moment in the life of an icon. Um, you know, the demons are definitely like hanging on to your brush. Um, so I've been commissioned. Anybody here Episcopalian? I know some of you are. Um, anybody here ever heard of the Oxford Movement? Right. So I've been commissioned by a priest, I don't know how he found out about me yet, in Seattle, who wanted an icon of these three so-called, I call them the Oxford Fathers. So. John Keeble, John Henry Newman, and um, Edward Pusey. And when he first contacted me, I said, well, like, ugh, I don't really do post-Reformation saints because, <laughs> again, the reason why is complicated. Um, but he persisted, like that persistent widow. And I thought about it, I went to the book of the you know, the saints that are commemorated in the Anglican Communion, and they were all in there. They all have feast days. So I thought, oh, okay, what the heck. Um, and so the worst thing about this, they, they lived, their movement was like 1833 to 1845, something like that. And they, this is sort of the movement that brought back the smells of bells to the Anglican 
church banquet. So um, I photographed some of them. You would think that that would be helpful. It's terrible because, and I have no idea how I've done. You know, my husband says it's the best thing you've ever done. And I'm like, yeah. you know, because you're trying to capture something about the person without painting a portrait. And a lot of modern icons are just, you can tell someone found a photograph of, you know, somebody and painted them in their street clothes and put a halo on them. And, you know, if they wore glasses, they get glasses. And it's like, no. You are not showing what somebody looked like in life. You're showing what they look like now. You know, you're you're showing what they look like transfigured um, because they now see God face to face. So, um, you know, I had to figure out what to dress them in. And in fact, they probably just wore black cassocks. And um, uh, so, but after the movement liturgical vestments became more common, so I dressed them in different variations. Um, the most fun I had is making a visual pun. Um, I had to figure out, th there are many ancient prototypes, and you'll see some here, of like three saints standing, you know, just standing there. So I figured, well, there's my format, there's my model. So now I have to figure out what order I put them in. So, okay, well, Campbell sort of kicked the movement off with this one sermon, so I'll put him on the left. And then who do I put in the middle? Well, chronologically, Newman kind of picked up the ball. Um, and then QC, Newman then famously left the church family for Rome. Um, you know, sometimes they, you know, they get away. Um, uh, and then PUC sort of picked up. So I, I had them in that order. I had decided PUC's theology was very focused on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So I figured I'd put him in the Oron position in a chasuble. Um, but when I did them in that order, he was like this over there in the corner. <laughs> so then I photocopied this sketch and cut them up like paper dolls and played around with them. And I ended up putting QC in the center, which allowed him to do this. Um, and, well, I'll save it for the next lecture. Uh, but, 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 the, but, but then I realized that by doing that, I had put Newman on QC's, like he's on the right to the viewer, but to QC, he's on the left which, you know, is not the place of honor. And also, he's on the left because, you know, he left. So, <laughs> <laughs> these are the kinds of, um, you know. <laughs> when taking some figures with a modern history to right. and you have multiple images you're working on, yeah. which age do you pick? That's a great, uh, another great question. We try, try, the saints and most icons should look kind of ageless. Yeah. Um, the, all three of these men live to a ripe old age, so they look fairly youthful, but I'm going to highlight their hair and their mutton chops mm -hmm. um, with white, which is how you make a saint look old. Um, but yeah, again, it's like you're, you're trying to resist the idea yeah, of- And yeah. this is the follow up on what you were saying about yeah. left, right, or center. Yeah. Is theologically Newman would be regarded in terms of his theology of history and development yes. as on the left. Ah, oh, yes, you're right. <laughs> and right. he's right. being canonized in October. Right. Right, that's right, yes. No, I, I, um, I've got to get this icon to this guy yeah. before that day. Do you know which day it is in October? <laughs> anyway, yeah. Pressure, <laughs> pressure. Um, but, oh, but that, that was the other thing. Like, what do I call yes, him, yes. right? I don't call him St. George. We don't use, after the Reformation, 
the holy men and holy women that we commemorate, we don't call it. So I settled on blessed, which is what the Roman Catholic Church uses to refer to people before they've been canonized. Yeah. So right now, John Henry Newman is blessed John Henry Newman, and right. he will remain so in my icon. <laughs> <laughs> 